The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. The Lord designed each and every one of us very specifically. From our voices to our looks, the way we walk, the way we carry ourselves, even to our attitudes. Everybody is made very specifically. And we're made to attract the attention of a very specific type of person or classification of person. But the problem is, everyone who's attracted to you, it was supposed to be for the will and the purpose of God, not for you to date. The Lord didn't make you attractive so much to attract your mate as to capture the attention of another so they would hear. But here's the problem. We thought these people were attracted to us and we wanted to date them. And then when it blew up and you said, boy, these people are crazy. Well, you're not supposed to date the, the, the people that are coming to you. They are crazy. That's why they need the help. You're not supposed to date them. Yes, they have an interest in you. But you're not supposed to date them. You are made the way you are. You speak the way you are so that you can depart the truth to them. In societies that we live in, people are hard-headed. They don't want to hear anybody. And it takes for a person outside of the body of Christ, for a person who is not spiritually mature, it takes some type of physical attraction or something has to attract them to keep them there long enough so that they can hear you. Well, it just so happens that some of you out there, yeah, people grow or have a particular interest in you. But because we live in this society where we believe if a person looks at you for more than two seconds, they like you. And then you respond, you end up dating, and then three years later, you're like, this person is nuts. Well, yeah, that's because you were supposed to talk to them, not date them. And so that's what happens. So there's nothing wrong with you. You had to be built a certain way to draw people. A person is not going to notice you by the Spirit if they don't have the Spirit yet. So they were made that way so you could help them. So I'll tell you what you do. Because you know this now, say, oops, I'm, uh, my, my Lord, forgive me. And understand that the next time, you see, if we would stop searching for that other companion, we would begin to recognize what the Lord is doing with our lives. The Lord will find you, your other half, if you're meant to have one, let the Lord do that. You be patient and perform his will. And then you don't have to go through all these experiences. These are called, you know what I call them, and they could be used for your good anyway, but they're nonsense experiences. They take away from the time in your life. They still add to your life because all things will always work together for the good of them that love the Lord who are called according to his purpose. But we don't have to go through that stuff, right? I'm going to tell you what I think. If... I were never to have a mate, then so be it. If that were the case, so be it. And I'll tell you why. There's not enough time for me to accomplish what I desire to accomplish in the Lord in the first place. And that's a fact. You see, my attention, my motivations, my outlook in life, my goals and everything else are tied in to the purpose of the Lord. And I find myself with a lack of time. There's not enough time. For me to accomplish what I need to accomplish in the Lord. Therefore, I'm not, I don't spend my days wishing and hoping for a mate, but I am very appreciative in the way that the Lord designed me. And I know that He refines us all the time. And I trust Him. So when He sends someone, He will send someone. He will let me know. I don't have to guess. You don't have to guess. When, when God sends you someone, you don't have to guess. But I can tell you this you won't have to guess because it will hit you deep down in your spirit. It'll be something that, that, that just supersedes the flesh. The flesh will have nothing to do with it. But when he sends someone, it is in fact something very different. Very different. Because here's a fact. All of us are going to age, get old, parts are going to stop working. And if you have based a relationship based on your, uh, you, you know, your physical components, you're going to be in big trouble. When the butt, when, you know, when the switch is turned off and nothing works anymore, then what? When gravity begins to work and things start dropping to the floor, then what? See, if you've based a relationship on physical attributes only, and you've not based it within the person, you're going to be in big trouble. But anyway, people, that's, that's you know, this weekend, that's what happened there. The Lord gives us a certain ability to draw certain people. 
the proof of it is this. Those same people you drew that were drawn to you, they can hear every word that you say. They can hear every word that you say. But you see, we're the ones who failed because we didn't know. We didn't depart the knowledge of the truth and keep it, stay at a distance. We didn't recognize that, okay, the Lord put this attraction here so they could hear me, so I could help their lives out. You see, because once you become attractive and you say, ooh, this person might be for me, you're also stuck saying, something within you tells you I can reach this person. But at the same time, you're trying to date that person. And then, of course, the end of the matter is that you cannot reach them again. And the dating part or the relationship falls apart. That's why you keep yourself separate. You need to understand how the Lord has designed you. And that everything he put within you is for his purpose. You're going to have your purpose fulfilled in the very end. If you're looking for paradise here on earth, you're messing up already. You really are. And some of us go, you know, 20, 30 years before we find this out. And then it hits us and we're like, oh boy, if I could just tell someone else. And then we run into the same problem. It's very difficult to communicate that to another person. And so we in turn have to be patient with them so that when they fall, we're ready to pick them up when they desire us to. We never point and say, oops, you fell. That's what you get. I told you. We never do that. We always say, can I help you? You extend your arm out. Can I help you? I've been there before. It's okay. Let me help you. Let's go forward. You see, we recover our brothers and sisters quickly so we can get back to work. We understand that the work that we're doing here is very important. But that a fallen brother or sister is not a funny matter. And it shouldn't be something that we dwell on for six years either. Or it shouldn't be something we scold another brother or sister in, but yet pick them up because they know what they did. That's why they're down there in the first place. If somebody has to pick you up, newsflash, you have fallen. That's just simple, right? That's very simple. And they know this too. That's just like a person who is sinning. They know what they're doing. It's just that a person who is in the body of Christ, who is made aware of a new revelation of God, then they find what's called conviction being put within them. And then they go and repent, which is one of the most precious things anybody can ever do to a brother or sister is to lead them to a truth, enough of that truth, where that person goes back in the, in, in the quietness or their secret place and they truly do repent. The fruit of that would be their life and their communication and how they communicate, where their interests are, their attitude. Everything begins to change. You see, because the gospel always brings a type of conviction. Yes, it makes us feel good. It holds a lot of promises. But it also convicts the flesh. And that's beautiful when a person comes to that understanding, because that's what it's all about. It's all about that, and all of us, all of us go through points where our flesh is, in fact, convicted. In fact, if we could count all the convictions we've had in our flesh, we would just have to throw our bodies in jail, right? Because it is, in fact, convicted big time. And it will continue to be as revelation is shown to us. It will continue to be. It's no mystery. That it happens, the Lord desires to perfect us in Him, not in us. He doesn't want us to perfect who we are in ourselves, but our lives must be perfected in Him. He is the true life that we do seek. You see, when all this is said and done, we're going to find out that He is really everything we've been searching for in the first place. We're also going to find out we had a lot of um, things that attempted to take his place, but it couldn't. You'll also find that the, you, everybody seeks a type of paradise, but a great many people don't know exactly what they're looking for is retained within the confines of their Savior. They don't yet see that. They don't yet see that, but they will. They will see it. Everybody's going to see it. Now, for those men and women who fight against it, they're going to see it too, but a different way. And you will behold... Every single one of you, you will behold the fate of your enemy. You know why? Because God said so. You will. With your own eyes, you will behold the price of their wickedness. You're going to see the fall of your enemy with your own eyes. That's not something we glory in. That's not something we look forward to and we begin to work just for that purpose. That's a side effect to who you are because you are, in fact, royalty in the making. You really are. Your life here is not happenstance. It's very purposeful. You know when you understand how purposeful your life is, 
you really do find yourself you, you root on even your worst enemy and you'll say come on that Lord help this guy help him make it because you understand that anybody in the flesh is subject to the evil of this world and if they're subject to the evil of this world you also know they can be subject to the goodness of our Lord and you would rather see them subject to the goodness of God and the freedom and liberties of God than the evils of this world you see an evil heart desires evil upon their enemies that's why Jesus said love your enemies it's impossible to love your enemy and desire them to face utter destruction but there does there there comes a point when you know that your enemies you know a time there is a time when they will be destroyed those are your true enemies not your flesh enemies this is a different type of en enemy you know in the Old Testament they fought people who were still mixed but the Nephilim they were third fourth fifth sixth generation Nephilim God wanted them destroyed because they tainted the natural seed of men everybody who, whom Joshua was sent out to destroy they had Nephilim genes they were large the Lord said destroy them there was one place he failed to do that one place he failed one place that would have no peace until Jesus came back anybody know what that place is it's called Gaza right there in Palestine Gaza he didn't do it and the Raphaim their spirits still dwell there which is why they have no peace and they in the end they would begin to um, manifest many different places anyway anyway I do love our Lord but we're going to talk about some I just had to get that out the way just because you don't see something working doesn't mean it's not working that's like us. somebody we you know there, there's no doubt there are people listening to this broadcast only to find out who we are they, they care less about the gospel or anything else they just want to find out what we know honestly they do it to every single broadcast that involves Jesus and I try to uh, I, I try to convey that with Pastor Paul because we're automatically discounted from what America thinks anyway just in case you didn't know that folks don't we see a shift with it and you know what I know this is Bible study but I need to address this subject people are noticing if you're hearing you're going to hear a lot more language regarding ISIS but there's a transition taking place I need to explain something to you if you had two people two people that stood against you in the beginning three years later you found out one was really bad and he attacked the one person he did something to the one person so the one person said let's go get him in other words one of your enemies included you and said let's go get him so all of a sudden you start working with your enemy to get the other enemy you know what will happen after you destroy one enemy after you destroy the one enemy then the other enemy is still going to be your enemy that will be like working with a snake to get rid of rats and then after all the rats are gone the snake bites you and you may ask why did you bite me and the snake will say because I'm a snake I'm still a snake what we see in the Middle East is that very thing and I'm, I'm wondering how many people are going to catch on to that how many know that Jordan's king sets a standard for the Islamic world how many know this you should dig up on dig up the history about Jordan's king before you go boasting anything how many know that Jordan's king also said Israel should not be there that that's not their land and that ultimately they're not going to be there how many know he said that how many understand that the Jordanian king made unprecedented unprecedented moves with the Pope and it's now has has launched an initiative beginning in 2009 and 2010 and 2011 to coexist a new religion based in Islam to coexist with other religions how many know that how many know that the Pope has an open seat in Jordan now you know what that may seem mundane but for an Islamic king that's unheard of you never trust listen th this is a spiritual war any way you look at it and ultimately anything against Islam according to the Quran must be subdued and or destroyed period and remember you're looking for a king of fierce countenance that king of fierce countenance he looks fierce the king of fierce countenance which means he's not going to be a smiley guy 
he will ultimately lead a revolution. But I'm just saying, before you go thrusting your stocks into an Islamic king who is trained and well-versed in many different disciplines, yet who made statements regarding Israel, and it, they were negative statements, you may want to be aware of that before you root an enemy on. You know, with an enemy, it's, it's something unfortunate. Normally, you don't find out if an enemy, that an enemy exists until they turn on you. You don't find that out in the beginning. Everybody's your friend in the beginning. Only when they turn on you do you find out they're your enemy. You don't find out in the beginning. And so this is what we're looking at. And we're seeing a power shift. What do you, because it's spiritual in nature. And I don't want anybody to be thrown off guard by what's happening. Do you think ISIS is of the flesh or of the spirit? Because if it's of the flesh, it can die quickly. But if it's of the spirit, the same spirit that's operating in ISIS will simply move to a different body. Do you understand that? So if it's spiritual in nature, it's not going to die. That's why we all must never fail to continue to pray. We can never get so weak that we can't pray. If we get so weak that we can't pray, that's not a weakness. That means we gave up. I'm going to be honest with you. That means we're giving up. In, in most cases, when a person, they find it difficult to pray, it really means they're giving up. It has nothing to do with their strength. It means they're giving up. You see, the Lord said he's equipped you. He, his grace is sufficient until the very end so that we are equipped with enough forgiveness, with enough maneuverability, with enough latitude to finish this race. But sometimes when we say we're tired, it's not what we mean. Sometimes when we say we're tired, we're looking for an easier way. And folks, that's part of the fire. And see, part of tonight, I need to talk about that fire, the refining fire. A lot of people are going to find themselves fearing the events that are coming upon the world. Don't fear these events coming upon the world. You know, the Lord said, do not be dismayed by what you see in the heavens. That's what the heathen does. That's what the heathen does. And they're called heathens for a reason. We're not to be dismayed by the signs in the heavens, knowing that our Father in heaven is the one responsible for them all. We can't be soon shaken by anybody using weapons like the other night was a good example. A lot of people did go into a, a, a little a conniption fit because of the word nuclear explosion. While that may seem minimal to most people, saying they just made a mistake, I found it very important, very important. It was a very important episode in the body of Christ because a lot of people in the body of Christ didn't quite know how to perceive it. And you always, when you don't know, you find yourself getting in a small bit of a panic. It's true. Us in the body of Christ, we read and examine all these things that are going to come to pass. But when they begin to happen, this is why last night was so very important. When they begin to happen, how are you truly going to handle it? You see, that takes a massive trust in the Lord your God. And it really filters out anything you thought was your motivation. And it, it does expose the real motivation. I'm more or less the passive. See, I'm going to be honest with you. If a nuclear explosion went off, I won't panic. But there's a good explanation for that. You see, I've been seasoned to deal with a great many things. I've also paid attention to a great many trials and tribulations. I don't ignore trials and or tribulations. I've been very see it didn't I didn't begin that way. The first time I was in combat I couldn't even you know what I had my body I had didn't have enough strength in my body to pull the trigger. So I didn't begin that way. There was no automatic strength at all. It takes time to cultivate a fearless attitude. It takes time to learn to trust the Lord. It takes time and that's why we have our trials and tribulations. That's why we shouldn't waste our trials and tribulations. You see, if we can reflect on every moment God did deliver us, your trust will increase. It's a mental thing. 90% of anybody's preparation, they rehearse mentally. Then they can get through it. I'll give you an example. They had a test of people who were learning gymnastics. They had half of the people learning mentally. 
They were taught exercises to sit, meditate, and imagine themselves doing it mentally, the exercise mentally, without moving their bodies. And then they had those who were actually training how to do the gymnastics. Six weeks later, do you know what the outcome was? Six weeks later? Who do you think was better, those who rehearsed it mentally or those who really did it physically for six weeks? Who do you think was better? Now, these were, these were uh, 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 high school students, by the way. These were high school students. But who do you think performed the gymnastics better in the end? You're right if you said mental. You're right if you said mentally. You see, your body, while you have muscle memory, which is how your body remembers how to walk and perform, mentally you teach your muscles everything they need to know. Those who did the exercise mentally but didn't do anything physically, they had a better performance than those who did it physically because they had mastered. You can work faster mentally than you ever could physically, but it causes one to pay attention to every single detail. And they rehearsed this stuff day after day, and it was embedded into their minds. And so when the actual test came, those who were mentally prepared performed almost flawlessly. Those who were physically prepared relied on their muscle memory, yet they still doubted themselves. Those who did not rely on their muscles felt themselves confident to perform what they had rehearsed mentally. If you are in fact not meditating upon God's word day and night, it's going to be used to your own personal disadvantage. Didn't the word say meditate on his word day and night? Day and night, meditate on his word. Reflect. And instead of spending all the time worrying about this, that, the other things you cannot change, spend your time meditating on his word. Find out through the course of your day how his word took effect in, in your life that day. Folks, I'm telling you, if you can do this, if you can do that, if you can begin to reflect on the word with everything that happens in your life, you'll begin to change internally. And then you too will be mentally prepared for things to come. It builds a trust. Number one, because you find out more and more his words are true and you don't distrust. You're not listening to everybody else's opinion on television or reading articles that do alter your opinion but you're actually meditating on what God showed you personally. Now, here's the opposite is true if you discount what God has shown you personally. If you do not meditate on his word, applying it to your life daily, then all of what he showed you that day is not going to be useful to you, though he handed your answers to you and you didn't use it. If you really want to be prepared, you need a high trust factor for your Lord and Savior. The only way to get that is to both observe your trials and tribulations and mentally go through your day to see his hands exercised in your day, to see how faith works in the day, in anybody's life. I tell people all the time, I need not go through anything personally when I have observed somebody else going through it. If you lose an animal, it's the same thing as somebody else losing a loved one. It's the same principle. You can mentally get yourself together quickly, but you have to meditate on God's word day and night, and it's not a labor. It's quite exciting. That's the part many people don't know. It's very exciting to meditate upon God's word because you get excited like a kid. You'll say, I can't believe his word is absolutely true. You'll say that over and over and over again. You'll get excited because you'll instantly know that every word in this Bible is in fact very significant. You'll find out your life. You've been living out Proverbs this entire time. And then you'll begin to use Proverbs as your guidance to respond to people, to engage people. And then you'll look back on the words of Jesus Christ and say, Wow, not only did he speak it in that time, but people can't help but to act the same way today. He gave us all the answers. Then you'll look around at your neighbors and friends because you have gone further and you'll say, Why won't they hear? Why won't they hear? What's stopping them from hearing? And then you'll see it. Then you'll be on your quest. You'll see the world and everything in the world from marketing to grocery shopping, from uh, comedies on television. Everything you see produced by the world 
works against the Word of God. It does. And it takes a tight maturity. But then you find yourself, you, you won't enjoy what you see on television anymore unless you're watching history channels. And you know what? I used to watch. The only thing I would really watch on television were things of historical value and things of that nature. Not movies, right? Not movies so much, but like the History Channel, sometimes Discovery, and sometimes this, unlike the Cassius Channel. But what happened was, when they began to introduce this other stuff that made people doubt that Jesus is Lord, it began to uh, make me a little angry. It also began to make me a little sorrowful. One groundbreaking show was called Ancient Aliens. That was groundbreaking. Because you know what that show did? It has turned millions away from Jesus Christ. But in that same respect, it's used as a filtering device. You know why? Because Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And if you've heard his voice, you're not going to turn away from it. You'll, if, you've, if you know his voice, you're always going to know his voice. But if you think you know his voice, you'll turn away from it and you'll go through life thinking you hear his voice and this and that and here Satan tries to solidify it. Those who hear his voice, Satan tries to fight you and say, no, you didn't hear him. You heard something else. And then someone with the false Holy Ghost will come up to you and try to tell you what your calling is or something like that and send you on a direction you never wanted to go into. And then another, here he comes with education, shifting you away from the truth of Jesus Christ. It's all against Jesus Christ. If you are sifted away from Jesus Christ, if anything makes you doubt any of the words in the gospel, get away from it quickly. You see, the Antichrist spirit is not anti-God. It's anti-Christ. Why? Satan's going to attack the key to your salvation. Not the creator of your salvation. He's going to. He can't attack the creator. He will attack the key. It's easier to hide a key than it is to hide the whole door. So he's hiding the key. And he tries to make people doubt their salvation. And if that helmet of salvation is removed from your body, the rest of your armor is useless. That's why people use the Word of God now as a weapon to destroy the saints. Satan used the Word of God to destroy and to deceive. You see, that your helmet of salvation separates you from all the false things out there. If you listen to a person's speech, and you begin to say, Jesus too much, Jesus is the way, he is the truth and the life, and this, that, and the other. You know what they'll say? They'll come back and say, well, why don't you say anything about the, the uh, give us some substance. We already know that. If a person says that to you, you have just annoyed, aggravated the demon that's influencing them. Who in their right mind would say to you, well, that's enough of that. Let's, let's, we need some substance. Who in their right mind would say that? When a child need not know anything, but if they know their Lord, the Lord's power will deliver that child from anything. No, oh, I'm going to be calm tonight. See, that gets me stirred up because I see these things in motion. But you know what's more important than me seeing? It's important that you see it in your own life, that you see it in your own home. If Dr. Vernon knew everything, that wouldn't do me any good. But he has to let me know where I can go find it. And then I can talk with him. If I knew everything, which I do not, in fact, the more I learn in the world, the less I realize I really know. And the knowledge I have mastered is stupidity knowledge. What good is it going to do me if I can build a computer from scratch in the kingdom of God, hmm? in the kingdom of heaven? What good is that? That's a foolish skill that's used for this world. Foolish. I mean, that's just, let me say it, that's dumb. Because it, it, it won't mean a thing there. Those who count themselves wise among men will find themselves actually foolish. And those who do know a lot about science, you know yourselves. It's a fine line you have to walk on. Because science will make you doubt a great many things. It causes you to look for proof. It demands you find proof. It's very difficult to maintain a balance with science. And uh, that's why when somebody is steeped in science, but they're like, like uh, um, the speaker Pastor Paul had on, very, I mean, good information, right? Good information. I personally can understand the struggle between finding facts the greater half of your life 
and then also utilizing faith because in science you're searching for so many facts you're not dealing with a type of faith it's a it's a mindset that you gather and he has beautiful balance because most people lose themselves in the science they're so infatuated that one plus one actually equals two that they begin to look for everything that operates with an equality well we know that faith is something you cannot touch nor see but it is in fact hope for and you do prepare as though it's coming you're acting as though something exists when it does not that's what faith is a scientist can't understand that though science itself is an act of faith because they're in the pursuit of truth and they don't know that truth does exist so it takes faith for them to be motivated to obtain it yet they can't figure that out they're geniuses but they can't figure that out can you believe that that's incredible anyway i won't go in that one that's a that's one of those roads we're not going to go down but i thank god for him i do because anything you know what the satan can only do this to you once he attacks you and you catch him he has to get back everything he stole from you you see when a thief is caught he has to pay back sevenfold number one that's why satan is never wants to be caught by you it'll be demanded of him by the lord he is forced to restore look what happened to job was he not restored when a thief is caught he has to restore why do you think satan hides himself if a demon is caught it has to restore do you really think it wants to restore no it does not they are the lawless ones and so he hides himself in a great many things he's very devious in his speech but he's masterful with education masterful where do you think marketing came from in, in in order for you to be a i mean just one of those top paid marketing executives you have to be able to fool the entire public you have to make them covet your neighbor's property you have to be an expert in causing them to covet anything boy we could go a long way with that one but that's part of witchcraft what do you think what do you think glamour is ladies and men what do you think glamour is do you know what the word glamour means can i can i just tell you this real quick glamour is a word that was used by witches to enchant anybody glamour is a word of witchcraft glamour is in fact a spell how many know that glamour itself is a spell found in witchcraft glamour began 20,000 years ago and the word was what glamour where somebody gets all dressed up with the makeup and all that good stuff and they look glamorous that's a spell just to let you know that and the reason i'm saying this is because to love the world is truly to have enmity with god separation from god truly god does not want us to pursue vain glories he does not you know what a vain glory is one that will ultimately fade away in the first place a vain glory profits nothing for the soul a vain glory is turned to naught glamour within itself is something that marketing agents thrive on every single commercial that you see they will appeal to the individual lustfully they feed your flesh reality television is designed for that very reason to feed your flesh you know what they found out a long time ago and i know this is not wacky wednesday but i'm being just being you know i'm i'm i don't know why i'm going in this area i meant to talk about something else and boy i went way off the highway but anyway um the world itself has devised television they've devised media your way of life and everything else it's a very it's a very careful orchestration of tools and enchantments to take you away from the truth of god you see the more you trust the world and if you can reflect back on this with your mind the more you were embedded in the world the less you had to have faith in the first place you see the world makes you depend upon it for everything the world gives you instant gratification for your efforts the world fights faith by the way it's impossible to please god without faith but the world fights faith the world tells you conform to us or be cast out that's what the world tells you is what it communicates to you. And in fact, television and the internet has people under a spell right now. If you don't believe me, why do they fight so hard to tell you what does not exist? 
Think about that for a second. Just really think about that. First of all, how can anybody tell you what does not exist if they've only seen the earth? Does that make sense at all? Does that make sense? I mean, if you're making dinner and you just cook some noodles and you didn't put pepper in there, you are qualified to say there's no pepper in those noodles. But if you made the noodles and somebody at the front door who does not know what's cooking and they say, whatever you cooked does not have peppers, they're not aware of what you put into it. They're not qualified to make that statement. They can't smell it. They can't see it. They can't observe it. You've not told them anything. Yet they become the instant expert on what does not exist. Correct? How can anybody be qualified to tell you or anybody else what does not exist? But you see the witchcraft used in the world because everybody's trained to do that. In fact, even with us, we began, we started out, and we would instantly tell anybody what does not exist. But we could not tell everybody what does exist. Now, what do you think that is? What do you think that is? That is a strong enchantment. And then when you begin to adopt the words of the Bible, you begin to find out many things exist, and you have to fight every step of the way through the world system that was embedded in your blood before you can actually begin to pick up the revelations of the Word of God. And you have some people that never overcome it. You know why? They trust in the scepter or the sovereignty of the kingdoms. That's what's happening to the world, folks. The nations of the world, entities of this world, everybody of this world believes in their own policies and in their own ways, and they trust in their own sovereignty. Sovereignty being the absolute rule of something, and they trust in their own sovereignty. They don't trust in God's sovereignty, His absolute rule of everything. And that causes instant contention because you've lived a lifetime when you're trained in the world feeding your flesh. And when you no longer feed the flesh, what does it do? It cries out. That's why it's difficult to break some people away from sins because the flesh is crying out for what it once had. That's why it's hard to lose weight for some people because your flesh cries out for that specific food. You'll say, oh, I'm craving this. Well, what do you think that is? If you're craving something, what do you think that is, honestly? What do you think that is? What does your flesh do anyway? Does it not crave your flesh? It craves all the time. That's the problem. And all you have to do is identify it. See, that's why we have to reflect mentally upon the Word of God in every aspect of our lives. And you'll begin to see little tools and mechanisms that shouldn't be there. It's like walking on the deck, a wooden deck. Right? You're barefooted. So naturally, you want to look at the deck and make sure there are no rusty nails sticking up out of the deck. Well, if you begin to meditate on the Word of God day and night, you're going to find a lot of rusty nails that shouldn't be there, that can in fact hurt your feet. All you have to do is mentally inspect. Your thoughts will clear up. You'll begin to take sound advice. You'll shun anything that's not sound doctrine. You'll begin to get rid of a great many things, and your liberty will be installed into your life. Why? Because you're absolutely adopting the precepts, the advice of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's why it's impossible to adopt the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ while we are walking in our own ways. That is absolutely impossible. It's impossible. Because when you're with the world, you serve mammon. Mammon is a Hebrew name for money. It's also a god. Consequently, it's the only God that Jesus ever compared his Father in heaven to. Isn't that something? So it must be a pretty powerful entity, right? Because it's more than an entity. Mammon is in fact like a brigade or large group of the very spirits that work iniquity upon this earth in the form of money. And because you get to touch the money, you get to touch a piece of that dark, foul, false God. And for some, it makes them happy. It changes. It alters your attitude. If you get more than enough money, your account, you, you could be loving one day, but the next day, something changes when you get a lump sum of money in your hand and you'll find yourself changing internally. All of a sudden, you say, well, I deserve this, so I'm going to do it. I deserve that. Until money becomes a tool to us all. It should be just a tool, like a shovel or a hammer. A shovel is not going to change my emotions, nor will a hammer. That's how money should be. If it alters us, do you not think that your Lord 
notices what it's doing to us. And so then he withholds it in a lot of cases. Or will give you just enough to make it. But once you're appreciative over what he has given you, and once you begin to use 50 cents the right way, he'll entrust you with so much, and then you really will not have room enough to receive what he's giving you. In fact, you'll, you'll, you'll give away a lot all the time. And it also comes with a responsibility and a burden. It's not all fun. Because then you have to qualify what you're doing. You have to hear him always with what he gives you. If God gives you something, he didn't give it to you for you to relax and kick back on the couch and do this, that, and the other with it. Serve the Lord with it or don't have it at all. Serve the Lord with it. Don't adopt the lifestyle of the word. It, the world seeks to take you away from the truth of your Lord. And it does degrade the life of a great many Christians. People who do honestly believe it degrades their life. And they all, for the life of them, they can't figure out what's happening. They're like, well, what's happening? I've done everything that's required. I do this. I do that. And still, no, there's, there's no breakthrough. What's happening? And if you inspect very carefully, you'll see it. Does the Lord want you to have provisions? You better believe it. Does he want to trust his vessels with greater provisions so they can actually be a provider for their brothers and sisters? Yes, he does. But he has to trust you with it first. He has to trust you. It can't be a one-time deal either. God never does a one-time deal to see if he can trust you. I found that out the hard way. He'll do it small here, big here, small here. And you know what we do? We start failing from the beginning. What? But then when you get it right, you see, he does a heart change first. He makes you appreciate what he gave you after you blew it. He makes you appreciate it. First, you're angry. Oh, I just wasted that. Well, Lord, if you do that, then you start making deals with yourself. Lord, if you do that again, I'll do right this time. You get nothing. All of a sudden, you get put in hard times. You see, the very thing he's trying to trust you with is the very thing you'll be stripped of. That's the very thing you'll be stripped of. And anyway, first we get angry. Then we go through these little fits and conniption fits, trying to make deals with him. And then all of a sudden, we, we go through a course of years in a time of lack and he waits till we stop complaining because when anybody has lack they start com murmuring and complaining well I don't think the Lord loves me because I don't have enough and this and the other and so he just waits till you stop complaining once you stop complaining and you begin to say Lord thank you for the one cup I have left in my house thank you for it well then that's when everything changes once that becomes consistent you have in fact grown spiritually and once you have grown spiritually you're able to handle the provisions and you're willing to do the right thing with it the lord will use you as a vessel to pour out on everybody else but it's a great responsibility if we murmur and complain did he tell moses he said moses i'll give you a brand new people basically he said i'll just fill all these i'll do away with them i'll kill them all i'll give you a brand new people because all they're doing is corrupting their own ways and murmuring and complaining. And then when you look in the book of Hebrews, when you see it, they tempted me in the desert, murmuring and complaining. If you're complaining about something, let me tell you what you're really doing. If I complain about anything, knowing that my father is in control of every aspect of my life, what I'm actually doing is saying this. Lord, I don't like the way that you're working. Surely I can find somebody else better. You're disrespecting him. Why do you think it tempts him? and moves him to anger, right? Of course, he's not going to display his anger but once. But why do you think that tempts the Lord your God to do that? Murmuring and complaining is not good. That's like backbiting the Lord and everything that he stands for. Anyway, you know, as we read the book of Jeremiah, we can see this nation, we can see ourselves, we can see people who've turned their backs to the Lord and his mindset concerning them. And they really will say, and they will believe, they will say, why has the Lord done all this evil against us? But you know what? It explains how they stood in their own ways, in their own paths, ignored the Lord's path, interpreted his word for themselves, and followed their own standards and what they thought was his path, not what he said, but what they thought was his path to make it comfortable on themselves, to live lavishly in his words spoiled by wine and they messed up because they had to pay for it you see because something is happening something is starting a process is beginning and the process will not end 
but the process is starting. Division within the body of Christ will only serve to separate the wheat from the tares. Some of the people you thought were tares will turn out to be wheat. Some of the people you thought were wheat will turn out to be tares. That's actually going to happen. Some people you discounted and said they'll never make it to the kingdom. They're going to make it to the kingdom. Some of those you thought surely this person was sent from the Lord. They're going to turn out to be tares. There are dead giveaways. There are giveaways to who is the wheat and the tear, but it is the responsibility of the angels that God does send to separate them both. It's not our job. We may discern who is a tear in our own mind, what the Lord may show us, but we are, we are to have hope for all things, are we not? Why? Because we operate in a time of grace and mercy. If we are to receive that grace and mercy, we must operate by that same grace and mercy. If we fail to operate by that grace and mercy, we ourselves have no grace and mercy. That's why it was written, for whatever measure that you judge, you're going to be judged. And whatever you give is going to be given back to you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give it unto your bosom. That's good or bad. That's good or bad. That's not just good. That's good or bad. If you're giving, sowing seeds of strife, contentions, if you teach a man how to lust after his own flesh or teach a wrong way, men will give back unto you that same thing that you sowed in this lifetime. Your reward will be here from that evil. But in that same breath, if you sow mercy to an individual, men will also give to you mercy. Some people are going to need mercy when certain times come. I'll tell you how, how, how direct and how important this statement is. When you find yourself in trouble and everybody has mentally contemplated, what will I do in the time of this visitation to this earth? What will I do? Will I have enough of this? Will I have enough of that? Can I share something with you? If you believe in the words of the Lord and if you have sown into other people's lives, if you have, in fact, attempted to sustain them, if you've given them something small, if you have sowed mercy to someone, if you've been inviting to someone, if you've tolerated someone, in your time of need or, and or desperation, you will reap the kindness, the provisions. You're going to reap everything that you sowed, and you're going to reap it, and it's going to be pressed down and shaken together and running over. That's good or bad. Now, I would rather sow something good. I would rather have goodness in my heart to sow in the first place and reap at any appointed time of a time of need for me than to sow something of wickedness and or darkness, something against anybody, knowing that in a time of trouble, that's when it's coming back. We're not here to judge anybody. That, you know what happens when you judge somebody else? your countenance changes. You know yourselves, and we've all done it. Every single last one of us have judged somebody else. And do you know what happens to our spirit? We find ourselves in a conversation justifying why we did it in the first place. In other words, we're fighting to get our own innocence back. That's what happens. For some of us, if we do a bad deed, it feels to us like filth. It feels filthy. And we have to fight to get our innocence back. We have to fight to get our positions back. That's why it's best not to do it in the first place. And the more you can adopt, the more you can understand this, the greater ability will be given to you to operate among all men, enemy or friend. And you won't have the issues you once did. The challenge is to overcome those who are close to you. You see, some of you have people that are close to you that just get on your nerves. They're put there for a reason so that you can overcome. Listen, if someone can get to you, you still have a weakness, do you not? Don't you have a weakness? If they can continue to get to you, you have a weakness. So now you can ask yourself, why didn't these people go away? Well, that's why. You are to get that weakness prepared in the truth of the Lord. When's the last time you went to Scripture when you were feeling that way? When's the last time you said, oh, that was not forgiveness when you felt that way? Yes, the person is supposed to expose that weakness. It's their purpose. Did not the Lord use Nebuchadnezzar to purge his people? 
Nebuchadnezzar was not on God's side. This guy was a tyrant, but the Lord used him. That person getting on your nerves, they're being used the same way. Some people can't stand to hear. They couldn't stand to hear Obama speaking when he first became president. They couldn't, they couldn't stand to hear him. And they didn't know why. They said, I don't know why it's so hard to listen to him. But those same individuals had a very low tolerance to a great many things. And the Lord was teaching them what? Patience and kindness and a tolerance. You see, you have to have things a little beyond the normal measure to operate 100% spiritually. Maybe you don't know that you're in spiritual warfare. Whether you understand that you're in spiritual warfare or not, you are. And if anything can get to you, it exposes a weakness. You can have, I can have the strongest distaste for something. I can. But I know how to go to my father. I know how to redirect this flesh and tell it to shut up. And in the spirit, ask my Lord to extend to them the same mercy he extended to me. You see, I'm not above sin of anybody. Because we're all sinners saved by grace. Therefore, the worst sinner in this world is still better than I am. Period. Because we're all sinners saved by grace. We sit in the same boat and we're all sinners saved by grace. You see, I don't want the Lord to ever come to a point where he will not excuse something I did, whether knowingly or unknowingly. You don't want to be in a position of desperation and receive no mercy and no grace. Now, why would Jesus tell us to do that in the first place? Why would he tell, why would he state that same thing in Revelation in the first place? You know why? Because at that time, we're going to need every seed of mercy and grace and provision and everything else we sowed at that time. You may not be here the entire time, but we're going to get our taste of some things. Your skies are going to change. The land masses are going to change. Everything is going to change. Everything is going to change. There will not be one thing that will not be unchanged. Do you remember the scripture that every island and mountain will be moved out of its place? Everything is going to change. Infrastructures will be lost. All of us are going to need our Father's grace and mercy upon our lives. Don't say to yourself, well, I'm going to be gone before that time. Here's why. Those same events happened all throughout times of history, but it was not the time of times. And before the greatest war in history breaks out, some of the events in the Bible will come to pass. In fact, let's go to Matthew 24 so we can just reconfirm something. Now, the Lord is going to get you. That's a fact. You're not going through the grunt of things. But see, all of us are going to be purged. All of us are going to be tried. The Lord said, pray that you're worthy to escape all these things. Can I, can I share something with you? <clears throat> if you've gone through part of it, evidently you didn't escape all of it. Anyway, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. He said, pray that you're worthy to escape all these things. But being worthy is doing exactly what he said to do in the Gospels. Which was what? To never ever place anything above him or your Father in heaven. To be his disciple. To bear that cross daily. To be a very specific individual. It's all based off choice. And then for some of us, the Lord has appointed us to go to be instructors. Because there are going to be people alive during this day. Jesus is our art of safety. We can't miss that. We're not going to miss that. And here's another assurance. The Lord knows how he designed you. He's not going to put you through something that will consume your soul. Excessive amounts of pain and discomfort and all these other things could consume your soul. He's not going to, he, he's not going to send anybody he did not design for a task through that. See, when you belong to him, your destiny has already been determined. And he lets you know your destiny. Some of you have had dreams. Dreams on top of dreams. And you're being groomed to operate in a very hostile environment. But see, the, the greater the troubles you have to go through doesn't necessarily mean you're hard-headed or anything. That just means you're found worthy to walk in that day. You've been designed to go through that day. We know there are going to be martyrs up until the very end. So there will be martyrs on the face of the earth. We know that people are going to be alive because it says the nations are going to learn the Feast of Tabernacles again. So some people won't die at all. They're going to be trained. A thousand years of peace, when you rule and reign with Christ, that message is for those who accept him now fully. See, if you halfway accept him, 
You're, you haven't accepted him yet. You have not come to that revelation where he is, in fact, the Lord of your life. If he's the Lord of your life, he's the Lord of your life in every aspect of your life. And then in that case, you're not seeking to save your life. But you've already lost your life for his sake. You're willing to do what he requires, and you're not concerned about what you need to go through, but how you're going to do it. Do you understand that you need him every step of the way? You're not concerned about how long you've got to be here anymore. You're not. You're just not. You're willing to do whatever it takes for his sake. Once we come to that realization, I, you know what I honestly believe in my heart? Once a person comes to that realization, those are the ones that will escape all these things. The one that committed within themselves, I'll do whatever it takes for it. I'm not concerned about what it looks like or anything else. I'll do what it takes. I think he's going to take those, and they won't have to go through anything. You see, the Lord has this way. He says, the first will be last, the last will be first. To the Jew first, then to the Gentile. All these things that throw the opposite of what we thought into motion when he acts. So I believe those that truly do lay down their lives for his sake. They've lost their lives. Right now, they've lost their comfort for his sake. I mean in truth, too. Not leaning unto their own understanding, but still maintaining that humility and meekness required. You see, because it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. The children of God, I'm sorry. So they, they're already a peacemaker. They operate meekness and humility. They have already met the qualifications by giving up everything that they could because they sincerely need the Lord to be first. They sincerely try. I think those are special people who do that. And I think that some who are reluctant to do that, they need to be moved. They need to be motivated. Well, in order for a person to be motivated, that the Lord may show them that he is God in every aspect of their lives, they're going to have to witness something, right? I can tell you right now, I don't need to witness something. I don't need additional proof. I really don't. I don't need a booming voice from the sky. I don't need voices or anything else. I, I don't pray for the Lord to show me a sign of anything. I need not see a sign. I do ask him to give me wisdom behind his word. I want to know what pleases him personally. I want to know how to reach my brothers and sisters. I do. I want to know how to reach people. I used to ask the Lord, I said, Lord, give me a, give me a voice of reason. Give me, a, give me some wisdom. I know what that means. Give me some wisdom. I don't care what I have to go through to get that wisdom. Give me some wisdom so I can communicate to people. You see, I used to feel internally the destruction that was waiting on people, but I could not communicate it. I said, Lord, I need the wisdom to do this. And he gave it to me. And he's still giving me that wisdom. So someone can be reached. It may not be for everybody. But so someone can be reached. Because he knows my heart is truly with my brother and sister. He knows it is. I'm not one to just say, oh, good, I made it. You see, I, I was one that I can never enjoy success alone. What good is success if you're by yourself? And so I found out that it is more joyful for me to see your success than it ever could be to see mine. You see, I am satisfied. I am content once I know that you're safe. If I know you're safe, I could lay in the middle of a street and I would be good to go. Because I know you're okay, you're safe, you're going to make it. It's when I don't know you're going to make it that I begin to do everything possible. And I don't run out of energy and I keep striving and going and going and going until I can see that you're safe. But the Lord put that in me too. That didn't come from me. I did not come from me. He gave me the heart that I have. He did. He gave me that heart that I have. And I strive to do that. You know, when I was younger with my sister, I used to protect her in high school against seniors who were twice as big as I was and wouldn't back down from them. It did look like a David and Goliath type thing. But I was worried about her safety, not mine. And so I would face anything for her safety. That was just the way I was. I do that with my friends. I would face danger for their sakes, for their safety. I didn't want them hurt. And you know what? As I grew, I found out something. If a person cannot enter the kingdom of God, then they will be hurt. They will feel a hurt of all hurts. And do you really think anybody in the right mind would want to witness another person hurting that bad? I don't want to see a person. That's real hurt. When you know, when they know they can't make it into the kingdom and they're done for, and the Lord says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. That's when they hurt. And everything that we've experienced now is not hurt. 
but that is hurt. That's eternal hurt. I don't want to see anybody go through that eternal hurt. Maybe that's why Jesus said, love your enemies. Because even he knew that they need a voice and that everybody has a chance so long as oxygen is flowing in their body. By the way, he allowed them to live another day. Why did he do that? Why did he give them another day? Same reason he gave us another day. When everybody said we were counted out, down for the count, God said, no, they're not counted out. He gave us another day, just like he's giving them another day. So who am I to deem them as being lost or anything else? If my father gives them an opportunity to choose him this day, then in that day they're not my enemy. They, in fact, become the object of my greatest concern. That's how simple it is. But the days are coming when we'll need, we're going to need a lot. You know, it's a lot of strange things that are happening right now. I don't think people are prepared for the weather phenomenon that will take place. I don't think people are ready for the spiritual overtones to everything that's happening. While the information is astounding that people are coming up with on their own, no doubt because the Lord said he would not have us concerning the devices of the enemy, I believe that the Lord is preparing his people for what's going to happen in the heavens, but we can never forget about the spiritual overtones according to the word. The spiritual issues and problems and challenges rise at the same time this earth is responding. Iniquity causes the earth to respond the way it does. As iniquity continues to increase, so will the response of the earth. So when everything starts shaking, right? They start shaking and everything else. Then guess what? So will the iniquity. The iniquity will grow. And what did the Lord say? Get ye down there, for the vats are full. The presses are overflowing. The wickedness is great. If you want to know when the end time is, it'll be based upon the iniquity, this running rampant in the earth. That's when God sends his angels to the harvest. That's when he separates the wheat from the tear. That's when he gathers his children. But why? Because the wickedness is great when that man of perdition is already revealed. He's the one that sets up the abomination of desolation. Those in Judea will have to flee to the mountains. I'll say it again. Not those in New York, those in Judea. They'll have to flee to the mountains. They're the ones that can't go back and take anything out of their houses. I'll make a bold statement. The tribulation begins in Israel. How about that? You want to know when the tribulation starts and where it starts? It's in Israel. Everything is surrounded by Israel. Most people say, well, that, that can't be true. Really? The Holocaust happened in Israel. I don't recall anybody else having a Holocaust except the Jews. I don't recall it being Russians. But was there a Russian Holocaust? German Holocaust? French? England? No? No? American Holocaust? No. That didn't happen to anybody else. We, we can't. Of course, Israel is the apple of God's eye. You know why? The land is. You know why? Because the land, according to Jeremiah, is the first fruits of God. What happened when the people entered his land? They defiled his land and made his heritage a reproach. What did he say he was going to do about it? He said he would have healed the world through them, but they committed fornication with every other idol and everything else that was out there. Now they had to pay the price of which God said he's not going to turn back his iniquity from them. That's why the beast is sent in the first place. Why to exact, to fulfill prophecy? How many know that the beast is going to rise as the beast to fulfill prophecy? That's what the Bible says. That's why the beast rises. You know why? God has put it in their heart to fulfill his will. Period. He put it in the heart of the beast to fulfill his will. So even the beast cannot do what it wants to do. But God has placed it. Everything in the heart of the beast to fulfill his will. What is, and what does the beast do when it rises? It places the abomination that makes it desolate in Jerusalem. It will trample the holy city for 40 and 2 months. That's what it does. But I'll give you a hint of something. There was an agreement made. You know when that agreement was made? 2012, an agreement was made. An agreement was made that not many people knew about 2012. If that agreement, that agreement will be broken with the launch of a nuclear device. That agreement breaks with the launch of a nuclear device. Not many people know that. That'll be something that will become more obvious in time. You know, we read the book of Daniel, and the agreement that this guy had began with war. He broke the agreement by way of war. There was an agreement in 2012 which will break with the use of a nuclear weapon. And by the way, the use of a nuclear weapon 
is closer now than it ever has been before, even during the Cold War. You see, because North Korea and Russia are talking to each other. North Korea just test launched its third missile, which also carry Russian-made propulsion systems. Do you see what's happening here? You guys see what's happening? China wants the public to know it's breaking ties with Russia is diminishing its ties with Russia. Do you believe that? Don't believe what the public tells you. Don't believe it at all. North Korea now has firepower to reach the United States. Iran has the capability right now. You see, all of a sudden, North Korea pops up with ICBMs because they've been shuttling these things by way of submarine to Kim Jong-un. And then again, Iran is bolstering its power. It's flexing its muscles. Persia, Greater Arabia, is flexing its muscles. Why now? You want to know why? Because Russia has been pushed into a corner. America has attempted to isolate Russia. We drop our oil prices. We start doing things, and Russia's having a hard time, yet his approval ratings went up. Russia's, uh, Putin's approval ratings went up to his people, so now they're bolstering their standing behind him, which has NATO very nervous. NATO is extremely nervous. No one knows what to do about the Ukraine. They know it's a strategic advantage, and Russia will not give up until they get that land. They need the launchers in place. When that happens, there were coordinates given to you all. There will be an episode where those coordinates are. And the reason I gave those coordinates out is so that you can understand it's all planned. Nothing is happenstance. And the Lord knows everything that's taking place. He knows everything that's taking place. Nothing can happen unless he has already ordained it to happen in the first place. Evil, in order for evil to happen, it must be given room to operate. God has already did that. That's why you shouldn't run around with fear, because God is in absolute control. Evil can't do anything unless God ordains things or gives it space to operate. Evil can't do a thing. The three spirits that come out of the devil himself, how many know? How many of you know that the devil has a spirit in him? Any, everybody know that the devil's possessed. You don't believe me? Let's go investigate something. We're just just so I can get it. It's fascinating facts in the Bible. I tell you, fascinating facts. Who would have Who would have ever thought that Lucifer himself was all messed up? That doesn't even sound right, does it? For Lucifer to be possessed. Anyway, the three unclean spirits. Who did they come out of? Did not one come out of the dragon? And what is the dragon? The dragon is Lucifer, that old serpent called the devil. Is he not? But one of the three unclean spirits came out of the mouth of the dragon and the beast and the false prophet. You know, when that hits you, you say, oh, no wonder Lucifer is nuts. No wonder he's crazy. Because he knows he's going to lose, yet he continues to do what he does anyway. Why is he doing that? He has lost his mind. Yes, he is. He's possessed. Something has taken him over. What is the purpose of the three unclean spirits that operate in the dragon, which is in the beast system, and the false prophet? You know what their objective is? To go out to the kings of the earth, every single last one of them, and to the people, what, whosoever would follow them, and to bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's their purpose. They work false miracles and everything else, ultimately to draw them back to the valley decision. And when the three unclean spirits are cast out, boy, I'd hate to see the look on their faces. And who, who, who gets rid of them? Who controls them? God does. He'll say, okay, I'm done with you. The indignation is accomplished and you won't exist anymore. You see, your father's in absolute control. All these storms and everything else that we're going to see, if the Lord said, peace, be still, everything would stop. But he will accomplish it. Anything he spoke is not going to undo. He made a way of escape from everything he spoke for his children. How many know that? And you know who gave us that way of escape? Jesus of Nazareth gave us that way of escape in him. He is the way of escape for his children. He is the reason that the angels will go out to the four quarters of the earth and gather his elect from the four quarters of the earth. He is that reason. So it's not very smart to us to second guess what Jesus has said 
and we can't trust in all these serpents in the earth, whether by a title of king or anybody else, because if they do not believe in Jesus of Nazareth, if they don't believe, they stand against Jesus. I don't care how nice they are. If they say that the Son of Man was simply a prophet and that he lied about being the Son of God, that makes that person a what? Against Christ. By the way, so Revelation is the end of the matter. Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation, the book of Revelation, is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is the truth. And isn't it amazing if that's the revelation of Jesus Christ, churches don't want to read it. Are you, are you, is that a joke? In fact, a lot of churches, they don't want to read the gospel either. They skip over places. If it gets to anything, like that scripture about being, you know, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men given to your bosom, they only say that in a good way. So when you read it, you say, oh, that's a money thing right there. You don't get the bad side. You don't get the opposite. You don't get the opposite. But nobody wants to read the revelation of Jesus Christ because they think it's spooky. But you see, they forgot to read the scripture that says the word of God must be discerned spiritually, not logically. If it says it has to be discerned spiritually, then you know you cannot discern it logically. And you'll be all over the place. You'll say that the dragon with the seven heads stands for actually seven old trees that stand in, I don't know, some valley. And when they butt a pine cone right side up, then the end is coming. You may make up a whole bunch of stuff. But if you discern it spiritually and you understand what it says spiritually, you'll only have understanding spiritually. If Jesus said you must discern the word spiritually, and this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, well, then it takes the spirit to understand it. Your natural mind cannot wrap itself around what's happening here. You'll always think you have the answer, but it will bear no witness within your soul. Your soul will be empty because it does not have the truth. But once you do get the truth, your soul will bear witness to the truth. And you'll say, that's right, that's that's what it is. I can't explain it, but that's what it is. I can't articulate it, but I know what that is. I know it, but I can't say it. It's what happens when your soul bears witness. Because you can't explain anything. And if you try to explain it, it's not going to come out right. You can try all day and it's not going to come out right. But your soul will bear witness. But we're looking at a process that will absolutely take place. It will. That's why it pays people to be very serious about their salvation. Not to fall into these traps of the enemy. To understand how you're designed, like when we initially began to talk. You're designed to attract a certain type of person. Not so you can date them, but so they will listen to you. Isn't it so funny, too, that everybody who attracts lunatics, they would say, they also love the Lord at the same time. Do you think that's a coincidence? Do you think the love of God in your heart that shed in your heart was put there by accident? And, and, oh, consequently, you draw strange people to yourself. If you owned a business, you wouldn't hire every employee, every employee that liked the job. I mean, you wouldn't date them with you. I hope not. But you're there to help people. How else are they going to listen to you? God said, how can they hear unless one be sent? Right? And if a person is sent... They have to have some quality or trait. You know, a lot of people knew who Paul was. They said, wow, this is the guy who persecuted Christians. That was enough to spark curiosity among the places he went. Of course, Paul had a temper tantrum, but still, he drew a certain type of person. Peter drew another type of person. You see, Peter tried to keep balance with the Jews. Paul went out to the Gentiles. What did Paul do prior to going to the Gentiles? He persecuted Christians. So he needed to be like a Gentile, a non-Jew. He needed, to be, he needed to be able to communicate with them. Not to be a part of them, but to communicate with them so they could hear him. That's why the Lord selected him specifically to go out to the Gentiles. And when people are drawn to you, that's a spirit of drawing. You're a certain type of person. Not so you can date them. So you can depart the word of the Lord to them. Because they do, in fact, begin. they hear you. And that's what sparks your attention. But you didn't know the fact that that was put there so they'd be drawn to you. Because they can actually hear you. They listen to you in the beginning. And that's what really, oh, they listen to me. You know, women do this a lot. If a man can listen to them, you sweep them off their feet. But if you're like me, you say, oh, telephone call. Beep. Or, or something like that. I listen. I'm just joking. But um, ladies like that. They like to have a guy who listens to them. 
But what they didn't know is the people who do listen to them, they had a chance to depart. So now that we know these facts, not to revisit that, but we know these facts now. Now we can move on from that. Because we were once lunatics also. We were. We were once lunatics, and, and somebody had to capture our attention. Somebody drew our attention and made us focus our attention towards them. And they did depart the word of the Lord to us. They did. They did. So we were also the lunatics at one point, and then we in turn draw lunatics, so that all the lunatics turn into children of the most time. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying you're a lunatic or anything like that. I'm just saying that's the behavior we did exercise, and it takes someone to draw you. Someone has to hear you, and you had to hear someone to get the word of the Lord in you. You just didn't go out there and, and all of a sudden something happened and think you heard someone. You heard someone. But the order of things, again, folks, is something I'm, I'm going to try to get this into you. But the abomination of desolation must be set up first. First, it must be set up. Remember the person who sets up the abomination of desolation? He's with an army. We can see that in the book of Daniel, chapter 11. He's with an army. They trample the holy city. Now listen to me closely. We've said this, I know I've said this a thousand times. And a lot of people are still going to be in shock and horror about the Holy City being trampled underfoot for 40 and two months. Three and a half years, the Holy City will be under siege. We read in the book of Zechariah where the city will be taken. After that purging event, the Lord promised to keep a remnant. Now you have to put your mind towards the people that the Lord will keep. He is purging his house. You must remember that everybody who seems or has the appearance of right doesn't always accept Jesus as Lord. The Lord wants his people because he said when he's finished, he's going to call them his people again. The abomination of desolation will be set up. The manner in which it's set up is going to be that the city will be trampled underfoot. It will be taken. Now, i got a question to ask you before I go. Where does America lie in this whole thing? What's happening to America right now? I want to pay attention. There's a trend forming in America. There's something happening in America. You know, the Lord said some things that were very direct. I don't know how many people pay attention to his directness, but he said some things that were very direct. Number one, he can never bless a place. He can never bless a place that built in its foundations or the blood of the innocent. That place can never be blessed. That will not be withdrawn from the most high. The Lord said it, and that's the way it is. They can have a season of reprieve, but they must, must, must that 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 whatever was based upon the innocence of others is going to have to pay. If any kingdom trusts in its own sovereignty and places their own sovereignty above God's, it will be taken down. The Lord has already promised to turn upon such places that are built that way. He's going to turn upon them those things that they built their places upon. So if they built a place upon violence and everything else, that's how it's going to be destroyed. It will be returned upon their heads. It will be returned upon their heads. All of these events, based on the Word of God, are always preceded by natural disasters. In Egypt, Egypt was in utter chaos. Plague after plague, diseases, things being let loose in Egypt. And it was utterly destroyed, left desolate. You see, before... The people are delivered. The sovereignty must be broken from any nation. I'm saying that because America will be greatly wounded at its heart. It'll be wounded. It'll be restructured. And only when they return back to God again. And it's going to take some things. And we already know nations. Nations will be sent. God will dwell in Mount Zion. And nations will be sent to partake in the, the uh, Feast of Tabernacles. We know that every nation is going to participate in this. And whatever nation does not participate in this, curses will be upon their land. So we know this is going to happen during the thousand-year reign. So the nations, though they will be shaken violently, though they will be broken, some will be restructured, some will be restructured, but they'll absolutely have a change in government, a change in heart. And you know what that tells me about America? Is that the, the current government that we have, is imploding in upon itself. You know, I actually began to see that in 2006. That's when the government actually began to implode upon itself. 
I noticed that too many people were standing against one another, and a house divided against itself cannot stand. It cannot stand. It will not. It, it cannot stand. Now we have more division now than we ever did, and now America is partaking in the division of their government. They're partaking in it. So America will be wounded. The natural disasters, though many think they have begun, I really do believe that they will begin now. They'll begin now. This will be the beginning of the shakings. This is when the coastal cities get nervous because of crustal displacement. This is when those who live in the islands will begin to fear because of the waves and because of the wind. This is where those who travel by air, by airlines, will be extra cautious because of radiation leakage and other things. The strange things arising. Not to mention there are spiritual, ancient spiritual things rising in the earth that have not been here for hundreds of thousands of years. If I can say that. They've not been here for a long time. When they had that uh, black mass in Oklahoma City, do, do you guys understand what happened? Go back and look at the earthquake swarms before they had that black mass and then look after at the earthquake swarms. I was sharing in, the, in, in Skype today, the Holocaust began in Oklahoma. Not many people know that either. The actual person that drew up the plans to rid the world of all Jews, that began in Oklahoma. That's where it started, in Oklahoma. The same individual. You see, there's a wickedness happening in the earth, and ancient things are being released. Now, here's another bad thing that happened, just to, just to share this with you. Some of the Jews, before they were being taken, they began to, you know what they began to do? You know what they began to do? They began to conjure up demonic forces, avenging demons. They began to conjure up avenging demons. They planned to capture these avenging demons in artifacts so that when the Germans came in to pillage their homes, the Germans would be cursed. One of the unwritten stories is this you don't know about. Many of the Germans had a horror before they died. And everybody who had one of those heart artifacts went through a horror. Well, you know what the Dodos did? They bought all those artifacts back to America and buried them as of late, as of 2009. You know what they did? They dug them all up. They dug them all up in 2009. And when they had this black mass, they bought them all to the black mass. And now, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think has been happening? These zombie stories that you're hearing about people with absolute takeover, that is absolute possession. No drugs found in the systems of those who were eating other people. Demonic possession. Even the people's, the, the members of the family knew the people. They were docile. But you didn't hear about the rest of the stories, did you? One guy ran 422 miles naked. No human being can do that. Running at full steam for 422 miles. You see, they suppressed these stories. And then he ate the face of somebody, and his father-in-law came out and shot him. Shot him and blew half of his body out. It didn't phase the guy. He kept going until he bled out. Do you understand what's ha happening here? When the beast does rise, demons are rising with him. There's an army of demonic entities rising with the beast. The wickedness of the world is giving them room to operate. Why do you think that the word says that day shall not come lest there come a great falling away first and that matter of perdition be revealed? Why does there have to be a great falling away first? There's a filtering process happening. They can't operate with the Holy Spirit all over the place. Demonism, Luciferian worship and all these other things are right there in front of your face and they are multiplying in the earth. And the other half who are not worshiping Lucifer directly are performing acts, I mean inhumane acts. And it's growing. But this is a filtering process. You, how do you filter out? I've got a question for you. Here we go. This is easy. If you had a glass full of water, how would you get all the iron particles out of the water? You put a magnet next to the glass, right? Just one little bitty magnet next to the glass. All the iron particles will stick to the what? They'll stick to the magnet. Therefore, you can pour the water out in a clean container and all you've got left are magnets or iron particles that stuck to the magnet. This evil and wickedness we see in the world is the magnet. Everything that is wicked, the wickedness within people is being drawn to this negativity. Whatever's within you is going to be drawn to the source of that negativity. If you're full of darkness and hatred and vengeance and all these other things, you're going to be drawn to the negative side. You're going to be drawn to that dark side. If you're full of light, love, joy, peace, 
You're going to be drawn to Jesus closer and closer. You're going to find out that you can no longer trust your own knowledge, but you absolutely need his knowledge. You're going to reach a point where you don't, you no longer want to operate or say anything that could even be halfway wrong about the Lord. This, this was the mystery of the prophets in Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Ezekiel when they said they were killing. If anybody prophesied on the land, they were going to kill them. These are the latter days. And that people would wake up and say, I'm no prophet. I'm a husbandman. I'm a farmer. That's all I am. You, you see, because as the source of God is reintroduced into this world, and because no, there will be no lying tongue before him. No one can lie, by the way, when his presence comes. So when you really want to know about a person, let his presence get a little bit closer. You don't have to discern. They won't be able to lie. And so people will absolutely tell the truth. They're going to wake up. So I'm, not, I'm no prophet. I know this. I know that I'm just a normal person. See, I've come to that realization already. That's why I'm not quick to claim a title. And I know that some people think I, 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 they, they call me for what they see me as. And thank God for them if, it, you know, if it's working in that capacity. But I'm not quick to take a title because I have a healthy fear and a healthy respect for the Lord. I don't want to make up things that sound good, that could be right. I need to know what is right. I'm the one accountable for every word that comes out of my mouth, I'm accountable. Not You're not accountable for the words that come out of my mouth. I am. And if I steer you in the wrong direction, that blood is on my hands. And that blood is eternal. So I can't afford to have loose lips and just speak out of my own emotional compassions or anything else. It has to be real or I'm going to shut up about it. And I can only discuss those topics of which I'm familiar with or unless the Holy Spirit works through me. But I can't talk to you about everything. I really cannot. Some of you are just like I am and better because you've been through a great many things. And once you reflect upon all of what you've been through, you're going to find a multitude of wisdom in what the Lord gave to you. I'm not quick to, to, to be like you either because that means i got to walk out your steps. In fact, I'm not quick to be like anybody. That means i got to walk out their steps to get where they are. There are some people I don't want to be where they are because they went through a lot to get there and that takes a lot of time. I went through my own little challenges. I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful for who the Lord made me to be. And I'm still shaking off the bad stuff. You see, we're, we're in a daily process of shaking off what does not belong. I'm not like most people. If somebody points out something in me, I take it under advisement. I take it to the Lord and I say, Lord, remove it. If I offend someone, I take it to the Lord and say, Lord, there was something else I could have done. Please show me. Give me the wisdom. I shouldn't be offending anybody. I'm not one of those ones that say, well, that person shouldn't have been offended because it was the truth. I'm not one of those people. There's always a better way to communicate. And I found that often when we communicate outside of the Word of God, adding our own words to it, right, and we have not walked it out over and over and over again, we mix in our emotions with a truth, and it starts to offend. I'm not one of those people that will say that. I have enemies out there, and I constantly say, Lord, please just let me communicate something to let them know that's not what I meant. You see, when a person hears what they want to hear, it lets me know that the Spirit wasn't speaking so loud that it could break Lucifer's hold on their ears in the first place. But I have found out that if, if you speak it from the Word, Satan can't do anything with it. Now, that's the funny part. If you speak it from your own knowledge, Satan can go to town with it. If you speak it from the Word, he can't do anything. It makes people be quiet. It'll make Lucifer go sit back down in the corner. He can't do anything with true scripture. He can do everything with the scripture we make up. He can do anything with something that's halfway right, but he can't do anything with the truth. He can't do anything with the truth. And guess what? Jesus already said enough. He already said enough. I need not make up anything new. All I need to do is search his word out, repeat what he said. What he said was perfect. What I say is full of flaws. If I tell you something, take it with three tractor trailer loads. Oh, forget it. Three, three, just take it with three convoys full of salt. How about that? But if the Lord said something, take it to heart. It's true of the natural realm and true spiritual. And so I trust in him more than I do myself. I can't count on me. If you're counting on me, shame on you, because I can't count on myself. I am nothing without the Lord. I can do nothing of myself. When we go through life, normally we get upset with people, either because we see something or they don't hold true to a standard that they've set. Okay? So in other words, we, we do in fact have expectations in people. Right? We have and when those expectations aren't met for whatever reason, 
it, it causes issues. That's just like a lot of people say, well, I can't, I don't like people who lie or steal from me. Right? That's what they, I don't, they don't like that. They don't like people who lie and steal from me. And the small things that a person can do, they, they really begin to hurt the most. Well, let me give you an answer behind that. All the big events that have ever happened to your life started out in small episodes, small things that led up to that big event. Nothing ever just came out and went boom, right? It always began in small things that were very deceiving. And so as you grow, when you see those small things, you think you're being set up to be deceived again, and you'll naturally begin to fight against it. Others get upset because they themselves have a standard, and they'll say, for the life of me, I don't know why a person would ever do that. I'll say, I don't know why. In both cases, can I share something with you? Just imagine if the Lord said, for the life of me, I don't know why they would do that. I'm so upset with them. He doesn't do that. The Lord doesn't do that. You know what he does? He gives us more grace and more mercy. Where sin does abound, grace does that much more abound. And so guess what? Did he not call us to be like him? He said, be you perfect as your Father in heaven is also perfect. Don't let your flesh enter into this statement. Understand the word perfect. We're not perfect in flesh. I mean, for goodness sakes, we got little dust mites chewing away at our dead skin. We're not perfect in flesh. Nor can we, our, our deeds are not perfect either. We strive for him to be. But you see, the Lord, the Lord loves us for us, not for who we can be. The Lord loves us where we are, not for where we're going. You see, the Lord fell in love with us through the idea of us being created in the first place. In fact, we don't know the depth of his love, but we know that we're still breathing despite what we did. And so he loves us unconditionally. If we are to be like him, we ought to love our brothers and sisters unconditionally, placing no expectation upon them. You know what? For me, it would be, I'm no king. Only a king would place expectations upon his subjects. People who have children, when your kids upset you, you know what I'm talking They upset you to pieces. Can I share something with you? They don't belong to you. They belong to the Lord. And you're just a caretaker over those children. Yes, they came from your biological material but you're just a caretaker to train them up in the way they should go. They don't belong to you. You have no ownership over your own children, just like we have no ownership over another person. And if we could actually absorb that fact and say, wait a minute, we are raising these children for the Lord's sake, and he's going to hold us accountable for how we raise them. They don't belong to me. They belong to him. Then we will begin to see. That's why correction and discipline should never be exercised out of emotion, but out of love. When you really love someone, the first thought you think of is, I don't want this person to go out in life and mess up like this in real life. That can destroy them. And so you begin to do things in love. Now that you know that, now that you know that, it's good to research this in the Word and put God's Word to it to understand that people belong to Him, not to us. They belong to Him, not to us. If we can reach another person, then we ought to assist them in finding Him assist them in finding a truth. Therefore, they can never disappoint us. They can't disappoint me because they don't belong to me. They belong to him. We carry their burdens, yes. I carry a burden for a lot of people because you see them falling and you see them at the gates of hell. And you'll do everything you can. Part of that burden is to keep your motivation in the right place. But you're not to have that burden consumed to destroy your personal wall. Sometimes that can happen. Realize who they belong to. And then realize why Jesus, you know what, if you can understand that, you'll understand why Jesus said, love your enemy. Because in fact, you really have no enemies. You just have people in the earth that are trying to find their ultimate destination. And we ought to have just as much grace and mercy as Jesus had upon us, as he has upon us, as the Father has given us. Because really, who are we to withdraw our grace and mercy over somebody else's life? Who are we not to forgive someone for anything they've ever done? When the Lord forgave us, and if he forgives us, why would we not forgive everything a person could do against us, knowing that we're going to shed this flesh and be with him eternally? Anything they do against his flesh is against the flesh. But we are not our flesh. Our flesh does not define us. It's like a car, a vehicle. And one day, the Lord's going to say, come on out of that car. I got a new one for you. And you see, everything that you were angry about, everything that everybody put scratches on your car, you need to remember, you're getting a new one. He gave you this vehicle for this earth, but you're not going to be here long anyway. It is, in fact, a vehicle for the purposes of your spirit, and you're on your way to eternity with your Father in heaven and your Lord and Savior. 
So guess what? Does it really matter if somebody kicked your tire when you're on your way to paradise? I don't think so. I don't think it really matters. I, I'm not going to be worried about anybody who kicks my tire when I'm on my way to paradise. They can't flatten my tires. They can't. And the enemy can only make you think your tire is flattened. But they're not really flat. He can't do anything. He only makes us think something has happened. You see, we're going to shed this anyway. And we have to change our perspective in the way of truth. We can no longer afford to buy the, this, this world that Satan has cast before us, which is full of lies and trickery and wrong ways and everything. Everything Satan does exalts itself above God's principles. God is his word. Anything above the word, uh-oh. God is love. Anything that is not love, uh-oh. Didn't it say cast down imaginations or anything that exalts itself above God? Didn't it say that the Antichrist, that the man of perdition would do that? Wouldn't he set himself above God or everything that is called God? God is love. The word is God. Boy, they're all intertwined. Don't let Satan trick you into not loving anymore. Receive the love of the Father in heaven through re-witnessing, if necessary, the acts of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then you begin to see it. But people don't belong to us. They belong to our Father in heaven. And Jesus is the caretaker. Jesus is. We're the vessels. We have but a minute responsibility here. He has the greater responsibility. He bears the burdens. COT's base of operations is right here at thecouncilftime.com. COT has no other outlet or venue. These are other folks who will rebroadcast. Anything COT does is by the main page here at thecouncilftime.com. of their own selves, covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemous. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved if you're not willing to repent? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.